Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us at the uh, end of the interdisciplinary program for the social and environment, the IBER, uh, for short, for Joshina Nakira's uh, uh, PhD defense. Uh, so, uh, just as an overview of, uh, of, the, of how this is going to unfold over the next hour, Joshina will uh, do a presentation. We'll have 10 15 minutes for questions, and then we will have uh, the oral examination after that. And uh, uh, then, if successful, we'll celebrate uh, out on the patio here at 12 o'clock, I believe. Uh, today, I'm joined uh, by uh, the examination committee of Joshina, which includes Chris uh, Sita, who's uh, uh, associate professor of anthropology in the School of Humanities and Sciences and senior fellow at Woods Institute for the Environment. Uh, also, Larry Crowder is co lead advisor. Uh, he's the uh, Edward Ricketts Provostia Professor of Marine Ecology and Conservation and senior fellow at Woods Institute for the Environment, as well as the other members of Joshina's committees, which include Rob Dunbar. Uh, the Cat Professor of Earth System Science uh, and the Senior Fellow of the Institute for the Environment, and also Jennifer O'Leary joining us on Zoom today. Jennifer is the Marine Director for Western Indian Ocean and Wildlife Conservation Society. So, uh, without further ado, I will turn the podium over to Krishna to introduce the uh, Joshi. Um, really a proud moment for me, as you can imagine. I wiped some of it. Really a proud moment for me. Joshina um, is first to be our first student to come this far, and this is a wonderful opportunity. You're not here to listen to me, and I've been told to keep it brief anyway, so I'll try. Um, I, I tell you, I was thinking, how would I describe this? What story would I start this little introduction with? And I'll start with my dear friend. We happened to be in Mauritius, uh, do some work on things unrelated. We went to a small workshop at the university where Joshina was presenting, and we came up going, we've got to get out of here. We've got to get out of here. We've got to do our best. We've got to do our best. It took a little bit of persuasion to, to, to apply, uh, but we managed. It's all Rob's doing. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, so Joshina comes to the, I came to the ISA program with a first class degree. Monash, uh, and I'm sure that it was still a difficult process to navigate despite the very background that she brought, but she managed it, managed it very well in an exemplary fashion. And I have to say the word exemplary applies to Joshina's work ethic as well, um, but also in response to the old adage, uh, opportunities are multiplied when seized. So we're going to hear today about how Joshina sees an opportunity and how that opportunity has multiplied into something more. Um, I just want to mention also, uh, we, I hope I can speak on behalf of the committee, Larry Fio as well, Jen as well, in the work ethic and just the general uh, dedication to the research has been really profound, it's something that we've seen and we're clear in terms of how much work she has done to get to this stage, but also she's been in service to her lab, mate. she's been in service to students and we're very lucky to have one here, um, in terms of leadership and so on, she's Provided service to other people around the university, despite all the work that she's had to do for herself. Um, her scholarship, really, we, we can't miss the big thing that's happening at the moment at the university, uh, not just the establishment of the new school, but what's happening in the oceans as well, and we'll keep that relatively quiet for now. Um, but it is an important moment for Stanford, and I think Joshina's work shows us the way that the social sciences and integrated approach using the social sciences data, other forms of evidence, so has really been the way that we're going to shape uh, much of what we'd like to achieve with the new Department of Oceans, to build understanding and knowledge, but also resilience within the context of small-scale fisheries, of ocean governance, and also environmental governance. Um, I think Joshina's work represents something that we all hope we can do, just bring environmental justice and social justice together. And we'll talk more about the research, we'll hear a lot more about it in a second. But I hope also I'll take this moment while I have the floor on behalf of all of the committee to thank everybody at the IFA and her friends and colleagues who are here today. And in particular, uh, 
uh, can reach has been incredibly supportive of all the other students in the book. I do as well. There's been a huge support network to get our students here to a really difficult moment. And we owe you all a debt of thanks. Um, just to mention that you'll have a chance to uh, celebrate, hopefully, in the reception. <laughs> in the reception, where we have the reception in, in uh, just across the road there. Um, but as I mentioned, I'll, I'll end where I started. It's a really proud moment as she discusses people and the sea in the masculine's social and ecological impacts of disaster. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Fresh and Theo. Thank you all for being here today. I'm pleased to share my dissertation findings with you all. I will be still speaking today about the relationship between people and the sea in the masquerade, delving into the social impacts of disasters. My interest in the topic has been shaped by the understanding that our response to all dimensions of global climate change and how we address anthropogenic stresses is mediated by culture. At the same time, as anthropogenic threats grow in frequency and amplitude, so does our need for adaptation and mitigation responses, which is also mediated by culture. Additionally, local support is instrumental for the success, but also longevity of environmental conservation efforts, which makes contextualized place-based research really critical. My research builds on these works in coupled human natural systems. In this dissertation, I draw on a community-engaged approach with a social ecological lens to highlight the environmental and social justice implications of these growing and compounding threats. I focus on coastal communities with an interest on small-scale fisheries. My other research interest also integrates the inclusion of natural and cultural heritage in ocean governance, especially for protected area management. I also look at factors influencing environmental behavior. And lastly, social learnings we can derive from disaster response and impacts. My geographic area of interest is the masquerines, a biodiversity hotspot. The red areas here show the global biodiversity hotspots around the world. And the masquerines is the area in yellow highlighted here of the east coast of Africa. Within the masquerines, my focus is on the Republic of Mauritius, a group of islands in the Indian Ocean 500 miles off the east coast of Madagascar. With 1.3 million people, the country has the same population size as San Diego, except that it is on a much smaller landmass just 790 square miles, but with an ocean area a, a thousand times its, uh, its land mass, as we can see in white here, which makes marine resource management incredibly important. Interestingly, Mauritius is also known as the land of the dodo, one of the most well-known examples of human-induced extinction in the world, which makes it even more compelling to look at environmental destruction from this lens from colonial times to more contemporary times. This is what the motion look coastline looks like, highlighting breathtaking beaches, but also our dependence on tourism and small-scale fisheries in coastal areas. I've been lucky to call this Paradise Island home. I am a Mauritian and have spent most of my life living and working in Mauritius. Prior to my PhD, I have worked in close collaboration with coastal communities while ma managing a marine conservation NGO located to one of the most important marine protected areas in Mauritius, the Blue Bay Marine Park. Marine protected areas like the Blue Bay Marine Park are designated areas of the ocean where exploitative and destructive practices are restricted to conserve marine resources. Building on my experiences with community-based projects in Mauritius, my research was thus centered around a local environmental stewardship framework to study marine protected area management. This conceptual framework by Nathan Bennett analyzes local environmental stewardship from a lens of socio-ecological context and change. In this framework, local environmental stewardship is defined as the actions taken by individuals group of networks or actors with various motivations and levels of capacity to protect, care for, and responsibly use the environment in the pursuit of environmental or social outcomes of stewardship. 
And these actions are dependent on three core elements, as we can see here, which are the actors, their motivations, and also the capacity that, that, that lies in these places. So early in my PhD, I worked on understanding the social and ecological context of coastal areas with marine protected um, areas of varying levels of restrictions, because they can be different. And I focused on different areas of the Republic of Mauritius and different islands, while also acknowledging how historical contexts can affect contemporary environmental attitudes and behaviors. However, <laughs> the landscape of the Mauritian coastline changed drastically in August 2020. When an oil spill happened, one of the worst ecological disasters Mauritius has faced occurred close to the Burube Marine Park, but also numerous other nature reserves. A thousand tons of oil spilled from a Japanese cargo vessel around the, an ecologically sensitive coastline. This amount is analogous to 10% of the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. However, it happened over a much smaller area and in a country which had never experienced an oil spill before, no benefits from the oil industry. This is what the coastline looked like the day after the spill, which naturally shifted my work towards assessing the social ecological impacts of this spill in these areas where I've been working for many, many years. I want to just take a step back here to focus also on why Mauritius is important from a social ecological system perspective. Why is it interesting that we look at uh, the context, but also these disasters within Mauritius? Let's start with the historical context. So Mauritius um, historically has been ruled sequentially by the Dutch, the French, and the British until uh, it got its independence in 1968. So we're talking here about around 50 years of independence. Really young country, uh, short historical period. The history of slavery, indentured servitude, and colonization, which combined with today's globalization, offer us a valuable case study within the Indian Ocean. At the same time, uh, Mauritius is important from a biodiversity perspective with high levels of endemism of flora and fauna, with endemics still being discovered today. However, there's also our vulnerability as a small island nation being impacted by climatic threats with sea level rise being a key concern. Our governance system and economic successes have been well appreciated in the African context. Mauritius is one of the leaders in Africa from a good governance perspective, but also like doing very well economically. However, we do have other uh, pressures. So, with a land area about 1.6 times the size of Los Angeles, Mauritius is one of the smallest countries in Africa by area. However, with close to 1,600 inhabitants per square miles, it is also one of the most densely populated countries in the world, which again makes it very interesting to look at environmental destruction from this lens. So all of these factors together makes the study of environmental stresses and responses truly compelling in this place. Small island nations like the Republic of Mauritius offer us this microcosm for analyzing the creation, implementation, and enforcement of environmental policies so that best practices can be applied to other island states or coastal regions dealing with this colonial legacy but also growing environmental pressures. And the historical context is also important because it is important to acknowledge that Mauritius does not have an indigenous population, did not have an indigenous population. The current population has been shaped by the multiple waves of colonization, with uh, people coming mainly from inland parts of Madagascar, Mozambique, and India, and other different regions, of course, but the, the majority is from there, which makes the which creates this lack of historical cultural connection around the sea, which we may observe in Pacific Island states, for instance. So much so that it is frequently cited that 85% of the population in Mauritius do not know how to swim. So again, here we can understand this like gap with the ocean and also awareness about what's happening in the ocean um, within the communities. So I'm going to be splitting my dissertation into two parts today. Part one summarizes some of the work I had conducted pre-COVID and pre-oil spill. 
But then as you shall see, there are important consequential events happening, and I will move on to that in the second stage of my presentation. So part one aims at understanding environmental attitudes and behavior in the Republic of Mauritius using a colonial history lens um, where I look at the two main inhabited islands within the Republic, so Mauritius and Rodrigues. To do that, I uh, you did semi-structured interviews with 50 key informants from both islands, and we covered a wide range of groups, so it included government officials, multiple political leaders, private sector, NGOs, both from the environment and social lens, academics, media professionals, religious leaders, and fishing leaders. And this is because I used a modified grounded theory approach, so as new themes were emerging, we added people uh, that could help us get a better understanding of the context. So the existing demographic and environmental nuances between these two islands, Mauritius and Rodrigues, make this comparative case study uh, highly interesting. Firstly, Mauritius has a larger population with a high population density. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, around 1,600 people per square mile. For comparison, uh, Palau has 125 people per square mile. So this is huge. Um, Mauritius is also uh, highly heterogeneous in terms of ethnicity, religion, and social cultural background, whereas Rodrigues is more homogeneous, with more than 90% of the population being of African and French descent, and mostly of Catholic faith. There is also a higher dependence on uh, ocean resources, so more uh, percentage of fishers in Rodrigues than Mauritius. And one of the key reasons is, like, as you can see here, the lagoon um, area is a lot wider, so access to the sea is easier. So you will have find a lot more people within the population who can just walk out and be, participate in fishing, for instance. Um, that also you know, creates this kind of connection to the ocean, which is interesting in that context. Um, and the historical context from an ecological perspective is also very important. So Mauritius was one of the top sugar producers at some point during the colonial times, which means that a lot of the pristine forests, most of our pristine forests, were deforested for the development of monocultures, whereas Rodrigues was less favored that way because of a hillier topography and like higher incidence of natural calamities. Um, Mauritius was then, you know, uh, related to the exploitation of ebony trees, but also mangrove forests around the coast. And today, we have shifted from the sugar industry and moving more towards the tourism industry, which means that there's more encroachment in coastal areas. So if you can remember, I spoke about 1.3 million people uh, in the country, but we have up to 1.9 million tourists per year. So, that the, so this means that we need to have more hotels to accommodate them, and there's generally, you know, this population pressure is there. Uh, comparatively, Rodrigues having the slower early pace of development, they've been able to choose that they want that slower pace. They want more greener tourism, and this is like the kind of island identity they tend to go towards. So these are some of the themes that came up uh, through our interviews. But one that I really want to focus on is the connection with the environment in both contexts, and how that is closely tied to the social and cultural context as well. So I will present some quotes that kind of like delves into uh, these uh, nuances. So for example here, the manager of a private ecotourism country company on Mauritius Island says, the main thing for me is the disconnection of the public with the natural environment, physical and emotional disconnection. In the long run, they would not want to protect, save, fight or participate for environmental protection. Followed by this Mauritian ecologist who says, we are one of the last countries to have been colonized by humans, and yet we have one of the most devastated habitats, with only 4% of natural habitats left. The solution would be, therefore, to have more educated people who are more concerned about the environment and themselves, actually. Because if they are more concerned about their own health, they will automatically start to get more concerned about the environment. Now we have a harder challenge, which is to repair so much of the destruction that has happened before us, so this is making things worse. It is easier for authorities here, this environmental officer on Rodrigue says, to implement rules with the Rodriguans being more concerned about the environment. Rodriguans are close to nature because of their work. They feel more concerned and want to participate. In Rodrigues, there's greater proximity between authorities and people. Mauritius is also more developed. So people may be against setting up conservation measures that seem to go against development because there's that high dependence there. 
And this Mauritian marine biologist says, bringing a change in Mauritius is more difficult. Rodrigans have a greater affinity to the environment. So we really reach saturation of these uh, themes that can come up across uh, these different groups. And when we go into like, why is that difference? The same um, a marine biologist says it is cultural. It is the same education being given because let's remember, this is the same national government Although Rodrigues has a semi-autonomous government where they are able to take decisions locally on their own. So a lot of the environmental initiatives they take within their uh, uh, semi-autonomous government. But it's the cultural difference that people seem to say is making the difference. There's also a better proximity to the environment. Comparatively, in Mauritius, we have inland and coastal people. And there's a huge difference in their perception of the environment, he believes. Less proximity makes them less sensitive. For example, visitors of marine parks may not know about the relevance of the marine parks at all. There is a missing link here to bring people closer to nature. Again here, the director of this leading environmental NGO on Mauritius says, Rodrigues has got better leadership and people are more connected to the earth and have a greater sense of belonging to the community. So we can see here that the social cohesion, the social cultural context have a strong role to play in that. Um, so what is the key element I want to remember here is the th constant reminder of the minimal connection to the environment in Mauritius. Um, some of the main reasons that people were saying there is greater ease of doing environmental stewardship actions and greater success in Rodrigues is because of their dependence on natural resources, the smaller size of the country, the proximity to nature, as well as the social cohesion. But what I want you all to take away from this chapter is really how the, high, uh, the minimal connection to the environment in Mauritius was constantly repeated. I will now move on to part two of my presentation, which incorporates, uh, which looks at integrating dimensions of human behavior in the creation of potential future marine protected areas. This was part of a very interesting um, marine endemics mapping around Mauritius Island, which was a joint project and collaboration with the Wildlife Conservation Society and the University of Mauritius. So this picture shows uh, the Mauritian anemone fish. So we have an endemic Nemo in Mauritius. Um, and so this group of biologists really came together, worked with local scientists to come up with this list of endemic and rare coral and fish species. And for a citizen science approach, which involved, uh, which relied on dive centers especially, uh, they mapped where all of these species were located around the island. Um, I, the part I led within this study is looking at the human dimensions. So how can we integrate environmental perceptions in the planning of these potential future marine protected areas? And how we went about this is uh, there was a, I was involved in conducting around a thousand surveys from seven coastal districts in Mauritius, so that's around 27 coastal villages. And uh, to measure pro-ecological behavior, I made use of this scale called the new ecological paradigm. So uh, it consists of 15 statements and looks at five different dimensions of how people relate to the environment and their environmental attitudes. For example, the balance of nature is very delicate and easily upset is linked to balance of nature. And people uh, say how they feel about it on a scale of uh, from strong, strongly agree to strongly disagree, so a one to five. And the means of these perceptions are calculated. Um, generally, the cutoff point is like if you have an NEP score of three, it means like um, a high enough uh, ecological be pro ecological behavior. So, what we saw so this uh, map demonstrates uh, the different existing coastal uh, MPAs around the island in blue. Uh, the triangles show where fish and coral endemics are present. And the purple crosses so show where uh, the coastal uh, social surveys were conducted. And basically, we were trying to see where is there an overlap of these endemics and also where people are more likely to want to protect them. Because uh, with marine protected areas, it is very important that there is local support, um, especially when they are coastal, because this is what will ensure the success of these MPEs. We really need people to respect these regulations for them to even work for, so that we can benefit from both social and ecological outcomes. Um, so from the social study, what was interesting here is that we've, we noticed district level nuances 
in uh, what aspects of the environment people related to. For example, um, on this side, Black River on the west coast, people related to the fragility of these ecosystems more. In the north, then districts where people are more concerned about tourism, uh, they wanted more management interventions. So we noticed district level nuances, which was um, interesting. The key findings from this study also showed us, as I mentioned, the overlap of endemics and willingness for protection along leeward villages, so more of the western coast. So if we were to have like ideally uh, marine protected areas with the goal of protecting endemics, this is the area we should be focusing on. This is the first study mapping threatened reef endemics in Mauritius. And um, we also were able to include this layer of uh, in including environmental perceptions to guarantee better protection if these were to be created as well. Um, and interestingly, with the NEP uh, measures, um, it's been mostly used. One of the limitations that's often highlighted with it is that it's been mostly used in the Western context. So this also provided us the opportunity of conducting this in the global south in a small island nation context. What I want us to remember from these two parts is really how our internal ontology is something as deeply internal as environmental attitudes can be used to help us understand something external, like local environmental stewardship efforts. We're talking about concrete actions and behaviors where our attitudes are able to shape that. And usually, generally, this is the direction we go in. Um, but I will come back to this diagram at a later point of uh, this presentation as well to see how dynamic it can be. So as I mentioned earlier, in the midst of my uh, research, everything changed. In 2020, when the world was in the middle of battling the pandemic, my island home had another catastrophe while I was in the country trying to write my thesis. Um, so the MV Wakasho wreck happened on June 25th, and the spill happened two weeks later on August 6th, uh, resulting in one of the worst ecological disasters Mauritius had faced. And guess what? As I mentioned, the bomb dropped around Blue Bay, and our most pristine valued coastline in terms of uh, nature reserves and ecologically sensitive areas. So if you can see the wreck happened uh, at the back there close to the reef and the oil spilled around this really important uh, nature reserve called uh, Ilo Zegret, which is managed by the NGO Mauritian Wildlife Foundation. And this is where they usually keep most of our endemics. So giant tortoises, pink pigeon, geckos, important flora and fauna. So when this all spill happened and the toxic fumes were really like the most there, a lot of these uh, species had to be relocated, which was complicated and chaotic. But uh, yeah, uh, so, so um, there was a lot of disturbance caused to both people and uh, ecology and conservation efforts. But this oil spill was also significant for other reasons. So as I mentioned, a thousand tons of oil spill around 30 kilometers of the coastline um, this was one of the first oil spills since the International Maritime Organization uh, started using a low sulfur fuel. So there was some kind of uncertainty about how it would react um, when spilled. Uh, the fact that it happened around an ecologically sensitive coastline and um, in a region which is highly, highly dependent on small scale fisheries um, as well. So all the houses we can see along the coast here are mostly fishing villages. Which leads me to the second part of my dissertation, where I will look at the multi-stakeholder responses that happened following the Wakasho oil spill, the impacts on small-scale fishing communities specifically, and how both of these disasters influenced concern for the environment. So part three, looking at um, the multi-stakeholder response. So in this part of the study, um, I looked at how government, NGOs, residents, um, and really uh, different stakeholders engaged in the response. But for this presentation, I will be focusing mostly on NGOs and local residents. And the reason we focus on 10 days is because our focus was on immediate response. Selected the first 10 days to examine the immediate oil spill response based on guidelines which recommend rapid and immediate cleanup. And this is because the quicker the response is, the, this means that we can reduce the negative public health, ecological, economic and social impacts as well. And this uh, chapter relied on document analysis, so we reviewed press releases, websites, um, official reports, so as you know, 
uh, the big document search to look at how different actors engaged uh, in the response. I don't want to focus on exactly what's in the content, just to say that these are the different actors. This is how we um, categorized it, and it went on until 10 days. Um, so what came up most strongly and what was most um, compelling in this case was really the community grassroots movements which happened. So let me remind you that this occurred during the COVID pandemic. So Mauritius um, still had an international uh, border closure, which meant that the, there was a slower uh, response in terms of international uh, support, uh, be it in terms of expertise or even resources. So when the oil spill happened, there was this general sense, you know, there was not enough booms. Um, and overnight, a small group of um, people came together to see what can we use locally to help the situation. This is what they came up, and this is what worked. So they used uh, sugar can bagas, a byproduct of the sugar industry in Mauritius, tried to wrap it in this fabric, and it was supported with plastic bottles um, to make it float. Guess what? It worked. It helped contain the oils, which facilitated pumping. And this news was shared on social media, and more than 7,000 volunteers uh, offered their help to make 57 kilometers of artisanal booms with material and donations provided mostly by community members and the private sector. So really a grassroots movement. Simultaneously, uh, as I said, there was a lot of uh, news on social media, but uh, there was, yeah, people were also sharing that hair can be used as an effective adsorbent, which led to a nationwide um, hair donation with barbers and hairdressers offering free haircuts. And people all over the island were just like cutting their hair to help with the oil spill. So this is the same place where the disconnect with the environment was highlighted over and over again. And we think, if we think about the cultural context of Mauritius, right, donating your hair is a huge personal sacrifice. So the fact that so many people were willing to do that shows that something really transformational had happened. This is what the coastline looked like at the end of the first week. So this is a picture I took um, in one of the fishing villages. And these are all local residents helping with the boom placement and uh, picking uh, the, uh, yeah, the trash out. And um, it is interesting that we see them, and important that we see them in proper protective gear here. But I remember the day after the spill, uh, right in front of where the wreck had happened, that there were fishers in their shorts and slippers in the water, taking buckets and removing the oil. Um, and that really shows the level of desperation that these people were feeling about this spill. So just taking all of these factors into consideration and how different actors were involved, this is what we would have anticipated in a place, for example, like California, which has dealt with oil spills in the past. Uh, which has all the equipment and resources to deal with a disaster of this scale. So we would have, it would be more top down with still some level of coordination with NGOs and residents. In the case of Mauritius, with these compounding com stresses of COVID, uh, closures, um, and there were also weather conditions, a lot of other constraints, this is what the response looked like. You know, the government was reliant on external expertise and resources which put more burden somehow on the NGOs and civil society in residence. And we can see the comparison here. Uh, what was interesting to observe in the process though, that although it was, you know, right after the spill happened, there was this official communique discouraging people from getting close to those areas. When the community mobilization happened on such a massive scale, there was this synergy that also developed between uh, government authorities and the volunteers. Uh, and then when um, there were enough experts uh, on the ground, there was this like peaceful phase out of like uh, volunteer action. And then, you know, things took over. The official cleanup started on uh, day 11. So this is when like, things started uh, getting a little better. But what this uh, part of the dissertation really shows is the impact of compounding disasters. Had this oil spill happened without COVID and the complications it caused, Mauritius would probably have had a better chance of, uh, you know, of a more effective response in these initial critical days. Um, it also highlighted the need for pre-disaster preparedness and the need to include different stakeholders before disaster happens. Because naturally, you know, um, this was just 
this was a spill from a cargo vessel. If it was an oil tanker, it would have been worse. So these are uh, low frequency, high risk incidents, and we never know, you know how much help we may need. So it's important that all stakeholders are engaged earlier on. Uh, and yeah, the massive community mobilization that happened is also a reminder of you know, how uh, local environmental stewardship and how, you know, how much power there is in local people caring about the environment. And that takes me to part four of um, this presentation, which looks at exploring the compounding impacts of these two disasters on small scale fishing communities. So earlier on uh, in the process, I was, invo I was involved in the social impact analysis where we looked at all the employment sectors that was affected by both uh, disasters. And as we expected, small scale fishing was one of the most affected sectors followed by um, tourism, of course. So uh, my goal here was to you know, just dive more deeply into uh, small scale fisheries. To do that, we conducted uh, seven community meetings and um, 197 household surveys in both uh, oil spill impacted sites, but also reference sites, which were impacted only by COVID for comparison. So this is what uh, the community meetings look like. And this were like, you know, uh, within weeks, so immediate aftermath of the oil spill where we went we, where I went with community partners um, and NGOs, first to try to understand the impacts, how are people uh, dealing with these stresses, but also to understand what kind of support they required. And this was supported by a uh, house community engaged project uh, funding. So the key findings on the impacts um, was first, of course, the loss of livelihoods and financial tensions that these, these communities were facing. But interestingly also, the change in diet composition and food insecurity, because these are areas where people relied a lot on subsistence. So for example, there are so many families that would tell me at dinner time, they would, they would just walk to the beach, catch a fish, come back, cook. This is what they would eat that day. This is what they would give to their kids to go to school the next day. So that we could see also a repel effect of these disasters where you know, attendance to schools were affected or other aspects of the general family well-being was affected because uh, now they had to tap into the savings to buy less nutritious protein as well. There was also emotional loss that people felt from this disaster. There's so much social activities cent centered around the sea. For example, women, women coming together to glean once the kids are at school uh, and partners have left for the job. So they were also mourning this emotional loss um, during that time. In terms of how people felt about alternative livelihoods, uh, some key points came out, which is the really high occupational identity linked to the ocean. Um, the fact that they had made private investments in ocean livelihoods. A lot of the people we spoke to uh, had loans where they had just bought a new boat um, and you know, they were looking forward to you know, make money and pay off the loans. So they were less, uh, especially right after that oil spill, they were less willing to you know, be part of upskilling or reskilling programs to do another job. And they were saying how you know, the ocean provided them the, the ability to be autonomous. So losing that was you know, this huge loss for them and they were not ready to accept you know, an alternative reality, which the oil spill forced them to, to do. But one of the main findings uh, that was the most poignant to me was the gendered impacts that were felt. So Mauritius has around 2,000 registered fishers. However, out of those, there's only 35 women who are registered. Out of these 35, 20 are located in the oil spill impacted area. But this also means that uh, women tend to be mostly unregistered, involved in you know, fishing activities of a smaller scale, like gleaning, where they just go out and they fish mostly for subsistence. And if there's anything extra and someone wants to buy from them, they are able to do that. But this was an important component of their you know, general life, um, social life, but also their livelihoods. So when these are all unre mostly unregistered women fishers from the oil spill area, but um, they, was, they really highlighted how, you know, when these stresses happen, usually registered fishers or applica applicants of registration tend to automatically get compensated. But they feel left out, they were feeling unsupported. And there was like this general feeling of like, as I said, 
not only financial but emotional loss and they were feeling like you know very concerned about the well-being of their families as well so when things were fine everyone was just doing the activities quietly and no tension was felt but suddenly when these disasters hit these more system systemic inequalities started co coming through which really pushes us to like think about how we can provide more gendered support when disasters occur next we move on to the household surveys so the household surveys were conducted around the oil spill impacted sites here. So this is where the oil spill happened. This is uh, the extent of the spill on August 15th. And this is where I conducted um, the surveys for reference sites, so sites which were only impacted by COVID, but not the oil spill. And um, we looked at changes, we looked at multiple factors, but the ones I'm going to present today are focused on household income and also changes in fisheries catch. So looking at the effect of COVID on household income, we can see that um, the oil spill impacted sites showed in blue here, uh, experience a higher decrease in household income than the reference sites. And um, this may be, this is linked to the fact that um, there was a lot of households dependent on tourism in that area. So when they lost their jobs, they naturally went towards the sea. This is always a backup plan going towards the sea to sustain themselves until they can find something better. And then the oil spill happened. And here we can see that reference sites, uh, either there was no change or the household income increased, whereas oil spill sites, it just kept getting worse. And we can see this stark difference here. But you know, 90% of the oil spill sites uh, said they had experienced this uh, decrease in household income where almost like 80% in reference sites that there was no, no change or you know, their household income actually increased. So we can see that when the COVID lockdown was over, people in reference sites had the chance to recover, whereas people in the oil spill sites were just you know, sinking deeper due to these compounding stresses. Notice the similar trend with fisheries catch. So if um, actually here, with the effect of COVID on fisheries catch, when there was the first COVID lockdown, fishing was prohibited. So we can see here that both oil spill sites and reference sites experience a similar kind of like decrease. But with uh, the oil spills here, we can see a similar trend where reference sites had the chance to recover, but oil spill sites just, just kept getting worse. So this part of the study really shows the impacts of multiple stresses that these oil spill impacted sites felt. And um, a key finding was also how there are invisible groups in these small scale fishing communities at such local level. And it was a humbling experience for me to remember that we need to design our research uh, approach and also you know, make sure that we are triangulating our sources of information as well. Because had I not gone with these specific community partners uh, or NGOs who had you know, such deep-rooted connections in these communities, we wouldn't have had you know, this, uh, this very personal insights from these women communities. Um, so this was, for me, a, a very interesting finding of, of this study. Moving on to the last part of uh, the study is uh, to look at how these uh, stresses altered environmental concern in this context, in the Republic of Mauritius. So how did COVID and the Wakashu oil spills uh, influence concern on the environment? And to do this, um, we conducted 792 household surveys. So with most of them being from oil spill sites, but we still had 229 from the reference sites. So similar approach that I showed earlier. And here, uh, we ask people very explicitly, has your concern for the environment changed after COVID, after oil spill? It was a yes, no response, where yes was coded as a one, no was coded as a zero. And um, after we did that, we tried to go more qualitatively into what triggered these responses. So what's interesting here is that for both COVID and the oil spill, people's concern for the environment was much changed at a much higher level for oil spill sites compared to reference sites. Um, and as a form of triangulation, I also used the NEP scale here, the one about pro-ecological behavior, to see if we noticed a similar trend. And it was the same. There was this general apathy with what had happened in the reference sites compared to the oil spill sites. So even in such a small country, uh, we can see these nuances, how proximity 
to disaster can have such a profound effect. And rightfully so in the oil spill sites, right? This is the crystal clear water these people are usually used to seeing. And this is what had happened, you know, this really dark sludge that suddenly uh, was affecting their lagoon, which is almost like their home. So I really wanted to go more deeply into what prompted this change in environmental response in these oil spill sites. And this is the kind of responses we got. There was like, in, refer in reference sites for people who said yes, you know, barely no response qualitatively, but in these oil spill sites, we got really rich responses from around 100 people, uh, where they said, our marine life is very important for our ecosystem, so we need to keep our marine environment clean. Followed by, I realized how everything would be destroyed if we continue to pollute. Lots of different uh, innocent marine creatures and mammals suffered because of the oil spill. There were lots of deaths. We have to face the consequences. Catastrophic conditions for the environment made me more worried. We need to protect our sea, otherwise we will suffer ourselves. And this was almost shocking to me because having worked in that region for so long, having been involved in so many environmental campaigns personally, but we're tr really trying to you know, push for how, uh, demonstrate how all of these systems were interlinked, how, you know, caring for the ocean means that, you know, caring for well-being. And, and there was always this disconnection. We felt like this information was not getting through. And it took, took like this disaster for people themselves to be making uh, these connections. And, and for me, this really happened through that deep feeling of loss that everyone was feeling. And this is one of the most compelling responses that I found, loss of nature, means loss of jobs, which really, you know, connected the fact that, you know, um, the impact on the ecological systems had a direct impact on their livelihoods. The key findings from this is really showing the post-disaster environmental concern that were felt, the deep connections between nature and livelihoods being established, and that these increased connections were triggered by the intense feeling of loss. So in conclusion, um, just like to go through these uh, key findings of this chapter, how uh, part one showed us that we need to understand the context and how local environmental attitudes and behavior affect environmental stewardship. And what it really showed us here, this was, I started this back in 2018, that there was this deep disconnect with the environment in, on the main island of Mauritius. Ch part two shows us how measures of pre-ecological behavior can be weaved into management plans. So if you can remember this diagram where something internal environmental attitudes affect external local environmental stewardship actions. Then we move into the uh, oil spill study where part three shows us the need for multi-stakeholder collaboration pre-disaster. There needs to be these uh, collaborations fostered before so that you know there's more coherent response after the disaster happens. There's a lot of policy opportunities which also open up after uh, these disasters. For example, the National Contingency Plan is now being updated. Uh, the authorities were reactive by setting up this zone around the island where vessels are not allowed in. Uh, so there's just more protection now. Um, part four showed us the impact of compounding disasters and the need to target invisible groups through, being, through more consideration with our research approach. And part five shows us how we need to recognize vulnerability through loss and how this connection between ecological systems and livelihoods were fostered, which for me showed that this is a dynamic system. You know, now something as external as disasters, COVID and the oil spill triggered this change in the environment. And this is where I truly believe transformative change happens. This is an island that has experienced continuous and external stresses first from colonizers and then from growing anthropogenic environmental pressures. We've already seen destruction on the island, whether it's the extinction of the dodo, monocultures, seasonal cyclones, and it has been affected by humans for centuries. But how much more can people in nature take? It was cathartic for me as a researcher to see institutions, uh, local organizations and communities in my country react this way. In just two years, we saw extraordinary change coming from Mauritius. But the thing is, we don't know how long this will last. This was transformative change in action. And I just hope that we don't need more disasters to catalyze uh, this reminder 
uh, about the importance of our homeland, our ocean, and everything it provides to us. Thank you.